Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost and I hope you stay tuned for the next half hour. We have two great features to show you. One is a classic we did back in the early days of Michigan Outdoors. Bass fishing researcher Bob Knopf gave us an interesting lesson in summer bass fishing. But first, we're gonna take a look at the summer drought, its effects on ducks, and what's in store for duck season 1988 in Michigan. Mother Nature threw us a big curve, plus all of our regular features, so stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. The decade of the 1980s, it hasn't been a particularly good one for waterfowl in North America, at least compared to how it used to be years ago. Even without this summer's drought, ducks have had a tough time maintaining their numbers. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has provided this report and this video, which explains that 1985's record low breeding populations, the continued drought and agricultural drainage of wetlands has brought us the lowest fall flight forecast on record. Restrictive hunting regulations began in 1985, cutting the bag limits in each state by 25%. Hunters have been taking less ducks each year in each flyway. And hunters, through groups like Ducks Unlimited, have been raising hundreds of millions of dollars to restore habitat. But despite all the talk about cutting hunting regulations back even more, even eliminating duck hunting altogether, a look at the breeding habitat across North America tells the sad tale of the real problem. The croaking of the frogs and splashing sounds of the potholes have literally dried up. Now, we don't fault America's farmers for trying to scratch a living out of the soil and provide us with the cheapest food in the world, but we do lament the cost, losing our waterfowl. To glean every bit of productivity from their precious acreage, farmers have cultivated right to the edges of the wetlands in their fields. The marshes are being burned, the very marshes that provide most of the ducks for North America. And you wonder why our ducks are declining the Canadian prairie pothole country has been vastly changed. 80% of the wetland edges and 59% of the wetland basins have been modified, cleared, drained, or burned by the mid-1980s. These are the areas where half of North America's ducks are hatched, or where they used to be hatched. In 1988, this area, some of the best production habitat for waterfowl in central Saskatchewan, is almost completely dry. The U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service surveys the wetlands and waterfowl each year, and this year they're hard-pressed to find water, let alone waterfowl. You can't have ducks without places to swim and nest. Canadian Wildlife Service biologist Dan Nyman says it's the worst he's ever seen. Okay, the summary for this transect indicates that we had 10 ducks on the survey today. Last year we had 145. Last year of those 145 ducks, 42 were mallards. This year we have only six mallards and ponds with water total seven this year compared to 66 last year. That's in one area. In southern Canada and the north central United States during the past year, biologists have counted one million less wetlands. One million less. One million less places where ducks have always nested and raised young and found food. Their potholes and marshes are gone. Not just temporarily, many of them permanently. Where there is water, farming has taken the vegetation around the edges. Might as well dry up the pond. Sure, things are bad, but think how much worse off ducks would be without hunters. That's right, Ducks Unlimited has raised hundreds of millions of dollars, which has gone into wetland restoration in the prairie country. Michigan organizations such as the Michigan Duck Hunters and the Michigan Wildlife Habitat Foundation are chipping away at restoration here in Michigan. In these managed marshes, ducks have places to come for food and protection and to raise their young. Whose money makes this possible? It's all from hunters. License fees and donations all go to preserve wetlands for ducks. Still, duck populations drop and are 16% below the long-term averages. Canvasbacks down 9% from last year, 22% below the long-term average. 
Blue wing teal remain 25% below the long-term average. Mallards have shown only a slight recovery from their all-time low in 1985. Pintails down a devastating 54%. But these are the problem species. These species have dropped their breeding populations to 16%, but there are bright spots. Half of the major species are average or above. The other half are down, so the problem varies with the species. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service survey results this summer gives us clues as to where the ducks have gone. Obviously, they've concentrated wherever they could find water, but they haven't paired up. They haven't been nesting. They've been biding their time. This means that reproduction will be minimal in these areas, and many of the ducks have been displaced farther north towards the tundra where there's water, but breeding habitat is poor. Some hunters are calling for a closure of duck season, but it's the loss of habitat and poaching in some areas that has taken most of the ducks. We have ducks, just less ducks, and they will sustain their numbers at lower levels with or without hunting. So why not close the seasons entirely? Because if hunters lose duck hunting, they'll lose interest in ducks. And it's our interest that gives waterfowl the best hope for the future. Well, for the lack of water in the inland areas as it has affected the fishing, we still have plenty in the Great Lakes. We're talking eight to nine kings off of South Haven, 85 feet of water. The catch and steel head up around Pentwater and 15 to 20 feet of water, but three to four kings per trip seems to be pretty standard around the Great Lakes, seven to nine off Rogers City. After this cold front went through a couple days ago, things are starting to settle down, getting a couple salmon, couple scamania off Oscoda. Easy limits on lake trout all around the Great Lakes. The season will be open, of course, until August 15. So those limits are easy to come by even when the salmon are a little slow. Looking at limit catches, which are circled right here, smallmouth bass seems to be hot up here at uh, Charlevoix area, Manuskong Bay, where there isn't much pressure up there. On uh, Pike and walleye limits on Bay de Knox, some 8 to 9 pound walleye as well. Houghton Lake getting limits of bluegill, got good catches of bass and some walleye they're catching up to 5 pounds. The perch, well, off Pentwater. Coho Bob says thousands one day, pretty tough the next. They're waiting for the jumbos to come in, according to Captain Nichols at South Haven. Getting lots of perch off Caseville, two miles out, 10 to 12 inches, and getting smallmouth, catfish, and walleye, lots of limits around Saginaw Bay. Up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, Dick Blau says the fish are deeper than normal, but it's getting better, and it's tough fishing. Why is the fishing tough? Well, they say there's mayfly hatches up there in the western end of the UP. There's low water. Rusty Gates uh, at the Osaba Lodge in Grayling says there's tons of grasshoppers this year. They're catching trout in the streams on moths at night. Blue-winged olives are hatching. Morning fishing is great. There's three sizes of the blue-winged olives, and they're awaiting the white mayfly hatch in the evenings and looking for some good fishing when you can find the water. And when you find the fish, a big one, register register it in our Strolls contest for our trophy book. The largest lake trout of 1987. Aw trains Keith Steinoff topped the Strolls trophy book with his 34-pounder taken on an Avery fly in Lake Superior. Lake Huron off Iosco County produced this 10-pound, 5-ounce walleye for John Beach from Novi, caught it trolling a hottentot. Dale Eichenberg from Caledonia was casting a fat Gitsit lure in Barry County's Gun Lake. He took a 21 and a half inch, six pound, three ounce largemouth bass. A real trophy for a bluegill, one pound, seven ounces, 11 and a half inches long. Don Coonrod Jr. from Channing caught it on a jig in Porterfield Lake up in Dickinson County. 12-year-old Kimberly Lynn Truxton from Baldwin on her first turkey hunt bagged this 18-pound gobbler after seven days of hunting. That hefty Tom had a nine and an eighth inch beard. The Pete Champnoy's family from Door eats a lot of venison. Last year, he got two bucks during firearm season, a six point and a nine point, while one of his two Kent County bow season bucks was a Stroh's Award 10 pointer. <laughs> we'll make Pete Champnoy's our Michigan Outdoors Buck Hunter of the Week. The governor has signed into law a bill to let the Natural Resources Commission set regulations for hunting and trapping. Senator Harry Gast of St. Joseph sponsored the bill that takes the control away from the legislature. The Natural Resources Commission is expected to okay a plan for 330,000 applicants to receive antlerless deer permits. Over half of those permits will be for the southern half of the Lower Peninsula. 
Reports from specialists in the Huron-Manistee National Forest indicate acorn production is virtually non-existent due to the drought. Acorns are an important crop for deer and turkeys. Salmon fishermen have reported the little brown water flea back again this year along Lake Michigan. It sticks to lines and downrigger cables, making it tough to fish at times. The DNR says it came from Europe originally in the ballast of ocean-going boats, and it's too soon to know its impact on the Great Lakes. According to Detroit Free Press outdoor editor Tom Opry, Fred Bear's ashes have been scattered near a secret spot on the Osable River near Grayling. Fred Bear has come home. Fred died in Florida last April at the age of 86. Some people are blaming hunters for the low number of ducks. That's just not true. It's far more of a habitat concern. And there is a poaching problem, although not one in which any legitimate duck hunter should take any blame. Now, how serious is this poaching? Well, according to the outdoor editor of the St. Paul Pioneer Dispatch, officials in Louisiana say only about one out of four ducks are taken legally. Now, the legal take is about a million, the illegal take three to four million, primarily in the state of Louisiana. Now, that's more ducks than Michigan hunters shoot in 15 to 20 years. A good solution would be for Louisiana to do what we do right here in Michigan. That's in addition to fines, duck poachers pay $500 for every duck over the limit. A three to five day minimum jail stay wouldn't hurt either. And if it takes more than that, then so be it. This gunny sacks full of ducks poaching has got to be stopped. Now, most of us who love duck hunting and hunt legitimately can put up with the skimpy seasons and the reduced bag limits because of habitat problems. But none of us should have to put up with less ducks to see or to hunt because of greedy game thieves. Bow hunter Bob Sims from Attica Township saw our feature on mismatched arrows and bows and asked, how can I determine if I'm using the right weight arrow without the use of a slow motion camera? According to Dave Schroeder from Anderson Archery, remove the fletching and shoot it at a target six feet away. If it veers to the right, its spine is too stiff. If it veers to the left, it's too light. Also, check your arrows at normal distances on a target. They should all land parallel to each other. If they're landing at different angles, your arrows are mismatched to your bow. Get back to your local archery pro shop and have them set you up properly. You'll be a lot more accurate with a balanced outfit. On Saturday at Fred Trost Hunting and Fishing Museum, Michigan Natural Resources magazine artist Nick Van Frankenheisen will be on hand with his artwork. Nick has won many awards across the state. His winter turkey painting made him a winner of our 1983 Wildlife Art Contest. He'll have paintings and wildlife art cards for sale. On Sunday, the guru of traditional archery, Ron LeClaire, will be on hand to demonstrate shooting with longbows and to show handcrafted traditional archery equipment. Now, Ron has shot everything from plastic discs and 50 cent pieces to aspirin for our television cameras. He'll talk about the origin and the history of the longbow and surprisingly, the versatility of the longbow. The museum is located one block north of the state police post and right next to Coyle's restaurant at Houghton Lake. If you missed a number, you can get it by calling the Travel Bureau on Friday during working hours. Decisions, decisions. All the uh, lures that anglers have in their tackle boxes. What lure are you going to use on a particular day? You think that's a big decision. What day should you go fishing? What time of day? How deep should you fish? What happens when the sun comes out? Bob Knopf as a fisheries biologist who uh, did some work where? Lake Isabella? Lake Isabella, right, just near Mount Pleasant. Okay, and you spent how long? About how two years. I, I spent one year tracking fish around, and I did it again another year and tracked a couple more. Tracking fish? I didn't yeah. know they left tracks. Yeah, they don't, but what <laughs> they do is we stick a little transmitter or a beeper in them, mm -hmm. cut them open, put it right inside, and then we follow them, we'll see where they went and what they did. What kind of fish did you use? Use largemouth bass. And I use big ones, the kind most fishermen like to catch. Like how big? Anywhere from, the smallest about three pounds, and they went up to about seven. So wow. three to seven pounders. 
Wow, okay, we're talking about trophy bass. This man studied them, not just with the beepers, though. I happen to know that you're a scuba diver. Right. You snuck we, down in that water. We went fishing and tried to catch them, and we went down and saw whether they were there or what was going on. Okay, now let's get into it. Let's see. A, f a lot of fishermen say uh, the best time to fish, for bass especially, is on an overcast day. Right. I kept track. I caught about 200 bass in this study, just fishing it, and uh, I had more catches on clear, sunny days, which really? was completely against everything that I hear and you think. I had some good catches on cloudy, but caught almost twice as many on clear, sunny days, twice and almost many. always during midday, when the sun was straight overhead. Huh? That is not according yeah. to... It's exactly the opposite of what you would hear. What you hear is that you got to fish for bass early morning, late evening. Tell us, what, since you studied them for so long, what do these big lunker bass do in a 24-hour period? Did you ever study them? Yeah. I went out and started tracking them sometime during the day and stayed with them for an entire 24-hour period, round the clock. And there was two types of bass we found. We found that some bass, usually the smaller ones, stayed in the weeds. And it's a weedy lake, and they stayed in the shallow weeds and just swam about at random throughout the day. Other bass stayed off on the, over the edge of a drop-off mm -hmm. at an underwater tree or rock or where the channel made a bend. And they stayed there during the daytime hours. And then when darkness came, they left the deep water and went up onto the shallow, weedy flats and joined the other bass, and they all swam around all night. The bigger ones are in the deeper water. They're in the deeper water during the day, and then at night they would move shallow. And I think this explains why a lot of people that go out fishing at night and wading along the shore can do really well, because that's when these big bass are coming in at night. Then again, right at the crack of dawn, they left these shallow water areas and went right back into the exact same tree that they were at before. The they same place? The exact spot. They stake it out? They stake it out. Well, when I went diving down there, there wasn't just one or two bass that I was falling around, but there was 50 to 100. Wow. 50 to 100 bass in one, one spot. Tree. Hey, if you... Oh, that's great, Bob, because now you know where they are, you can just clean them out, pick them like grapes, right? Sometimes. And then sometimes, even when you know they're there, you'd go up in your boat and you'd make 10 casts and you could catch 10 fish, just like that. No problem. You just pick them up and scoop them into the net. Great. And other times... I'm glad you're here <laughs> because you can tell us how to predict when to catch those 10. No, I can't. It, I tried to find out why that happened, but I never did. There's other times when you can go out there and you can throw out there and you won't catch any fish. There's something out there that's causing these fish to either turn on, become more active, to start to feed, and then there's other times when they're just sitting out there not, and they won't take anything. And you're telling me after two years of intensive research, you can't tell us why? You can't. No. It's well, not light. To, I measure light intensity, for example, and it's not that. I went, I lowered a meter down and checked the, the, the amount of light that was down there, and it, it isn't that. Well, it's probably the salooner tables. Well, well, possibly could be. I uh, checked the times that I caught my fish, and, and although I caught fish when it wasn't a salooner period, I caught all my best catches were during the, a salooner period of one type or another, either a major period or a minor period. So there might be something to salooner tables. I think there tables. might be something to that. I would oh. tend to look at them a little more carefully if I was maybe the average, just a guy going out fishing, if you had a couple hours to go mm -hmm. out. I tend to go out during a salooner period. Hmm. What about um, temperature? I measured temperature, and what happened was as the water temperature got warmer, the fish became more active, and when they, they still stayed in their area during the day, the big fish stayed mm -hmm. in the deep water, but at night they would roam as far as a mile or even two miles at night, which is pretty far for a fish. How fast do those bass move when they're and They're just casually up. swimming around feeding. They just kind of move at a slow pace, but when, in the mornings when they come back to their daytime spot, they swim awful fast. You can go almost half out with, five, with say, a 10-horsepower motor and just keep them right ahead of you. So they're scooting back? Unbelievable fast. They're scooting back to that same tree to take the same post. That's right. Day um, after day. With all the, and I assume, I, I had two bass that did that that were at the exact same tree, and there was, when I would, would dive and see, there would be maybe 30 or 40, and I assume that all, a lot of these bass were doing the same exact thing. Wow, that is interesting. Do you think that this just applies to bass, or do other species have maybe similar patterns? Where they stay and what depth they're, they're found at would vary, and that would vary even among bass if you went from one water to another because the Lake Isabel is a rather turbid lake. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think these activity periods are when these fish are actually biting. You can go out and catch bass, walleye, and muskie at, at the exact same time. I think all the fish are somewhat turning on under the same whatever it is that's turning them on, the same whatever condition. Is. pH is something you hear about a lot. Test the pH. <laughs> pH is a 
crock? Yeah, it's it's pretty. <laughs> it's really overrated. I've taken a lot of pH uh, readings, and it's just it's not something like temperature that's one thing. It can be you can have pH five that's one chemical, and you can have uh, go to another water and have the exact same pH, and it can be altogether different. Hmm. Huh. But uh, every angler has an opinion as to what it was the best time of day, the best time to go. Bob, just sum it up in a. Simple statement, after two years of research. The best time to go fishing is when you can get out there, of course. Yeah, daytime fishermen should, if they want big fish and they want to get a bunch of them, should probably fish the drop-offs. They can go at nighttime. If they go out at night, they can go fish the shallow, weedy areas with a surface lure or something that's weed-free and just cover a lot of water. And they should be in about the best shape they can be. But go fishing whenever you can. Great right. advice, Bob. <laughs> How can you tell if a deer or a rabbit has browsed on a shrub? Deer have only lower incisor teeth and must jerk twigs off branches, leaving a ripped or frayed end. Rabbits have both upper and lower incisors, leaving a neat 45 degree angle cut on the twig end. Came in as a runner up in our fish and wild game cooking contest last March. And it's one that so many people say they don't like because of how it looks. This is sweet and sour Belgium rabbit that Gloria Warren from Dearborn Heights uh, contributed. And she won a second place with this. And I, despite what other people say, I defend this. I like this You liked recipe. this last March during I the cooking it. contest. I loved it. I like it has prunes in it and so on. And you know the prunes make the meat look so dark. Right. Give that, it a good gravy flavor. Uh, Bob hasn't stopped eating, though. Mm -mm. <laughs> Heck, I like this one when, when, um, when we reviewed it on the show, or on the special. Yep, there it is. Prunes, it, onions. And a whole bottle of sweet red wine, and you, it kind of counteracts the prunes, actually. It does, because it, this recipe does not taste heavily laden no, with wine. It, no, it doesn't. you got your vinegar and water. And the, and rabbit. the rabbit. Right. No, we trimmed the rabbit really good here, Fred, just like you say, week after week. Well, rabbit is dark meat because it's an animal that runs. It uses all its muscles. The back right there. Oh, there oh, you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's delicious dark meat. <laughs> delicious meat. You're going to add vinegar to this, Right. Huh? Now, we're going to kind of marinate this, actually. The vinegar and water will, a lot of people will soak the rabbits to draw out the blood and well, the bad taste, they say. I, I like using rabbit or salt water overnight right. with small game. It brings the, the blood They do out the of very it. same thing. Now, the vinegar will give it just a little bit different flavor also. Now, you want to pat it dry because you don't want all that vinegar flavor into your casserole or or however you're going to prepare your meat. And that's the rabbit right there. After marinating overnight, you can see a it's There's lighter. There's a difference, right? It's, it's, it's lighter. Transparent almost. Take some of that out. And we're going to fry this in butter, and we're going to fry the onions first here. They're kind of deceiving because your onions are going to brown very quickly in the brown butter. Well, and the prunes we get to later blacken the onions yep, very frankly. Yep, they sure frankly. do. Yep. And this doesn't take very long to fry. Just want to brown both sides of this. No breading. Absolutely not. And like I said, you're going to add the whole bottle of wine, and it's just kind of actually stew in the wine. If it looks like chicken, that's because rabbit has some characteristics of chicken sure as does. far as flavor goes. Now and this, here, like I said, just, you add this whole bottle of sweet red wine, and it, it will counteract those prunes. There's not that many prunes in here. There's only like 12 to 18 prunes I in I don't this. know why you, we brought up prunes so much, <laughs> and you keep talking about counteracting prunes. <laughs> prunes taste great. Prunes need counteracting sometimes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I like the flavor. In fact, don't they kind of act themselves? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you guys, uh, I like eating the prunes out of this recipe, as well as the onions, as well as the rabbit. Okay, you the got a deal. <laughs> we'll eat the rabbit. <laughs> this is a case. This is a case, Fred. i got to get this in, where the student... I think even did better than the originator of the recipe. I complained it was a slight bit dry. This isn't dry. Well, I don't know what you did get. Cooking for our wild game cooking contest right? is sometimes oh, under adverse conditions. That's but, right. But look at this. Oh, I loved it anyway. <laughs> look at this rabbit come right off the bone and look at inside. The meat just looks like dark meat on turkey. Scrumptious. Oh, absolutely. Gloria Warren, in my book, you've got a winner. I love <laughs> this sweet and sour. Winner. A big winner. Would you like a copy of each of the award-winning recipes we feature during July and August? Well, they're in the Outdoor Digest magazine, along with a mailbag and quiz questions and answers. Find out about the Outdoors Club events we have coming up, what's new at the museum, how to qualify for a Stroh's Award so you can appear in the trophy book, and articles such as this in Fisherman Jim on how to catch walleyes with spinners. 
Uh, you don't have to be a handicapper to learn how to be safer and more comfortable outdoors in the Outdoors Forever section. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll take you stream trout fishing. There's nothing more beautiful than the early morning and late evening on a trout stream. We'll also have a classic recipe and a lot more. So join us next week, same time, right here on PBS. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan.